Good morning, everyone. Uh, PPL is one of the most important uh, developments in uh, health professions education. Problem based learning now widely adopted in uh, medical programs internationally. PPL has proved to be effective in promoting active learning, collaboration, communication skills, and critical thinking. A particular goal of this student center problem-based approach is to develop physicians, uh, our uh, doctors to be, uh, to who practice science in action, rather than attempting to apply loan formulas to clinical education. Uh, the, role, the roles and responsibilities of PPL tutors are really important. The specific roles of tutors vary or different among medical educations. Uh, in deep now, PPL in health, uh, health professions education is new. It got mentioned at the infant stage. There has been there hasn't been any formal PPL training to the training yet. That's why the workshop is taking place today. Marking an official and formal training event in Vietnam in general and at the VNU, the campus uh, of Vietnam National University in uh, particular. Uh, today we are honored to welcome Dr. Uh, Medical Doctor and Julie Ash, a senior lecturer and also the PBL uh, consultant of uh, Flinders University. I would like to introduce and I would like all of you to welcome her. Yes. Uh, and uh, Ms. Jillian Kent, also the PPL consultant from Medical School of Flinders University. Uh, Julie, we call, we call them Julie and Nigeria in a very uh, friendly way and official affectionately uh, manner, yeah. Um, Julie and, Julie and Gillian, yes. Julie and Gillian have been uh, tutors and researchers in PPL for nearly 30 years at Flinders University or throughout Australia, yes. Uh, we also warmly welcome Professor uh, Dan Bang Phu, Dean of the VNU Medical School. <laughs> the workshop will not be successful without the presence of uh, all distinguished guests and our uh, faculty who are, I would like to introduce directors of teaching hospitals of the VNU Medical School, uh, professor, associate professor, lecturers of University of Medicine and Pharmacy University, Fun of Tuck University of Medicine, Eastern International University, the colleagues of the VNU Medical School, and uh, we also would like to introduce, and we are very honored to welcome Professor uh, Lei Wang Nghia, uh, the head of the Department of Surgery. Yes. We would like to welcome uh, Professor Chu Phi Hong, uh, the uh, head of the Department of uh, Public Health. <laughs> we would like to welcome Professor Yu Dai from uh, Eastern uh, International University. <laughs> we would like to introduce Associate Professor Nguyen Tung Vinh, uh, Vice uh, Head of the Department of Surgery. Uh, Associate Professor uh, John Kong Toi, uh, head of, uh, uh, is also the head of the department. Of, uh, so. Associate Professor John Fang Jung Thuy, uh, the head of the department of ENT. And uh, uh, all the, the lecture, the, the, the faculty members of our medical school, I would like to welcome all of you. Uh, the agenda of uh, the workshop today has uh, two main parts. Uh, the opening speech and the overview of the medical uh, PPL implementation at our medical school. 
uh, presented by Professor Dan Blackford and uh, a very important part and uh, a, bit, a little bit long part uh, is uh, the PPL uh, topic lesson, the PPL topic presented by Julie and uh, Chilean. Uh, the workshop also uh, welcomed Professor John T. Lai, head of the Department of uh, RG. So now I would like to uh, invite Professor Dan Renford to give the, the afternoon speech and the overview of the implementation uh, of PDM at our school. Please. Thank you very much, Dr. Lai. Good morning, everyone. I would like to, uh, to begin the workshop today by extending our warmest welcome to Bibian Consultant, Dr. Judy As and Mr. Gillian Keta from the College of Medicine of Public Health, Flinder University. This is Mr. Gaston, Director the teaching hospital of the Vietnam National University Medical School, professor, associated professor, lecturer of University of Medicine and Pharmacy, Ho Chi Minh City, Pham Gokdam University, Easter, uh, anywhere, International University, my colleague at the uh, Vietnam National University Medical School in Ho Chi Minh City. They are head of a faculty of departments such as the internal medicine, surgery, OBG, pediatric, infectious disease, ENT, public health, and so on. <coughs> For maximum amount of time on the main content of this workshop, I intend to give a brief but very warm welcome speech of all of you and also present a brief overview of our PPL. This we apply in our School of Medicine, Vietnam National University at Ho Chi Minh City. We call uh, VNU Medical School and we also call it Yi Uc Giang uh, as the short and affection name. Uh, this is uh, the School of Medicine belong to the Vietnam National University. I think this is the PBM problem based learning. This is must do activity in the module integrate curriculum. And uh, I, would, I would like to say this is the is faculty of medicine, or school of medicine. Uh, we apply, uh, only, maybe this is the only school of medicine we apply them the uh, uh, system-based uh, 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 curriculum. Doing the PBL is our, our deceiving and uh, dispensable environment in our modern integrated medical curriculum. In the development orientation of the VNU Medical School, we focus on developing of the MD curriculum with criteria such as integration, adaptability, and standard alignment. One of the key of obtain the goal is that our school has managed a lot to implement PPL. While some universities have adopted and applied several new trends and innovation in the medical and education. TBL, team-based learning. For example, we have uh, you have uh, been using in the most popular approach PBL as a trigger approach. Also, taking the initiative on to do PBL is very challenging to us. We find that doing PBL is uh, be difficult and rewarding, especially for our medical doctor to be. The student need to, uh, to, to equipment not only with medical specialism, 
specialization, but also with important skills such as active learning, communicating, speaking information, problem solving in teamwork, sharing ideas, developing and testing hypotheses. We can say for sure that PBL is an example for active learning, not broad learning. That is a very, very, very problem in the education system in Vietnam. And memorization, uh, broad learning and memorization. That is a big problem with our education problem in Vietnam. The group together build skill and find solution. Thus, PBL is uh, the effective model of medical teamwork and communication. It is necessary to co contextualize, to standardize the modern PBL implementation. We agree that the success of PBL will open the opportunity to create and uh, el uh, elaborate knowledge in the group situation. There is a necessary for our medical school to contextualize and standardize of modern PBL implementation. Let me make a brief description of how we do PBL at the School of Medicine, VNU Ho Chi Minh City. For the last 10 years at my school, PBL has been used not only with students working in a small group, PBL has also applied in the context with lab group. And PBL also been done in the individualized learning. We have got some findings from the realistic practice. Students could learn about multi-dimensional of uh, adopting in medicine. PBL play a particular role in the implementing PBL in fact, the order to become a, con a, con a confidence tutor, a teacher on it, is to observe a class and <clears throat> to receive formal staff uh, training and development usually a must to understand the requirement for assessment. So, Tutor training is very important. Even experienced medical teacher may be unfamiliar with PBL. PBL is an example for active learning. This is a skill that we must learn. Far as as for us, we can see the term PBL mean different thing in the different medical school. We invite two. PBL consultant from Flinders University to be here to share with us their 30 year experience in doing and managing PBL. Flinders has gained impressive achievement in health professional education. The PBL workshop provides information on the curriculum context of a PBL session, tutor responsibility, and expression to student role and contributor. In the follow-up, trainee tutor will observe and direct and practice with the few session with two experiences effective PBL tutor. They are Julie and Gillian here. Once again, I want to affirm that PBL is an example of active learning and if not, to mention in Education 4.0. It contrasts with broad learning and memorization. And in the workshop today, Julie and Gillian will share with us this with all of us. Time is moving on. I must leave my part here and go cordially in, uh, invite Julie and Gillian to share with us we wish all of you a good morning. Before I forget, also wish you a good evening 
with our Vietnamese and football team in Malaysia. Yeah, this is the but, uh, big, uh, uh, very big uh, event uh, today. And uh, we wish them we, we are with. Yeah. The best wish during the uh, also the Christmas season and Happy New Year. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor and Matthew, for leading and for leading the opening stage. Now uh, we move to the next part, yeah, the very important part uh, of the workshop today. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Julie and uh, Julian Shen and uh, Jim 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 so that we can become the very strongest active learning doctors early. And so I will now find the pointer. And I don't 
don't know about you, but that most active part of most lectures is trying to change, work out how to change the slides. of PBL for understanding learning and teaching and then I want to uh, explain the implications for curriculum design and delivery. Now most of you are people who want to be uh, know how to do PBL, be PBL tutors. So after this presentation we will start to train you as tutors but there is a bigger context in which you teach. So this presentation is about the bigger picture. I think a key point I want to make is uh, to build on what I've just said is that problem-based learning is not the same as problem solving and this has been one of the challenges of implementing PBL. If a clinician thinks the tutorial is about problem solving only, they may become frustrated. But if they understand that PBL is about so what do we learn on the way of our problem solving? And sometimes we need to explore that learning as we go. And we still come to the solution, but as you will see on the slide, As you can see on the slide, I've tried to illustrate this graphically, that we still do the problem solving, but in the problem solving, we expand outwards to all the learning, which means that we can apply the learning we have with this one problem to other similar problems. We take that learning with us. So that is a key point. And in my school, some clinicians it was an aha moment to understand this and then they understood about PBL and were happy to do the PBL process. So, what do I mean by problem-based learning? From my perspective, problem-based learning means facilitated, small group, collaborative, student-centered, active learning. And I hope in this talk that by the end of the talk you will understand what I mean by facilitated, that is my role as a tutor, small group and collaborative. Collaborative is the way the students learn. That it is student-centered. It is about the student learning, not what I want to teach because that's been designed into the case, in your case. It's about the collaborative learning and where the and how the students are showing me their learning. And it is very active. The PBL case progressively presents a clinical problem. And like any of you, when you are first in an emergency room or see a patient for the first time, it stimulates you to recall what you know and think what is going on here? What do I think this is? What is most likely? What is not likely? What is dangerous that I must also think of? We all think like that when we are clinicians. So the students are stimulated to ask questions. 
and find, bring forward relevant knowledge. So the problem-based case for the students is in fact one of their first patients. But instead of it being a real life situation, instead of it being a simulation in a high-fi laboratory, it is what we would call a low-fi simulation because it is a cognitive apprenticeship case. They need to think through and the case makes the thinking very clear. As a tutor, I can see what each student is thinking by what they bring to the discussion, by what they write on the whiteboard. So these real cases drive curiosity for learning and they find out what they don't know about clinical sciences. So now they are curious to know more. And in the process of working through the case, as I hope you will understand by the end, they are in their very first stages of rehearsing their clinical reasoning. And this facilitates integrated learning because the things they don't know that they bring to, relevant to the case are integrated in the idea of the case in their minds. So, as um, Kev was explaining, we have been doing problem-based learning at Finlas for a long time, since 1996. And I was one of the first trained PBL tutors. And for quite a number of years, Jill and I have been running PBL tutor training at Finlas. But it isn't, it isn't such a new, new thing. And like all good things, it has been persistent. In the 1960s, Howard Barrows is a Canadian neurologist. He was based at San Francisco, uh, University of California, San Francisco. He wanted to help his clinical students think about cases. He thought about how do we reason clinically? And he created a, a schema, I will show it to you. And that is the basis of PBL. In the 1970s, Howard Barrows went to McMaster University and they designed the very first even integrated PBL-based curriculum. Other universities saw the success of this and picked it up. In, through the 70s and the 80s, the University of New Mexico from the USA, who came and trained us at Flinders, uh, the Harvard University, uh, USA, who I've been to and visited. Uh, the Newcastle University of Australia, who also came to train us at Flinders. So you can see there has been a lot of sharing of this educational know-how. And now I come to share it with you. Um, Flinders and the rest of the world began PBL in the 1990s. Now we see it across all the health professions. At our school they use it for speech pathology, for optometry, for audiology, many, many different sorts of health professions. And across the rest of the world. Um, it's now no longer just an innovation, although for each school when they take it new, for them it is an innovation, but it is now regarded as a mainstream method for teaching in education. So, let us think about, oh, thank you, active learning. Active learning is any learning that engages a student in doing. For example, remembering, thinking, reasoning, reflecting, synthesizing, integrating, evaluating, critiquing. These are all thinking doings. These are active thinking activities. Communicating, listening, explaining, questioning, responding, inquiring, discussing, elaborating. I will explain elaborating. Uh, cooperating, collaborating, facilitating, and teaching. Yes, the students too facilitate and teach in PBL. 
These are cognitive activities. They are also behavioural activities. They are also social activities. Now, at this point, I'd like to check a couple of things. Am I speaking clearly enough for everybody? Good. I'd like you to know that I will let, leave these slides with VNU to send to people in the audience. So that will help you if you are taking notes. Most of you who are involved in education may be familiar with Bloom's taxonomy. It is regarded as sort of an, uh, as the kind of main framework for teaching and learning. And as you will see, this framework is all about doing, remembering, understanding, applying, analysing, evaluating, creating. And I would say, as health professionals, we go sideways from there into acting. We decide, we act. It's the highest point. Okay. So there, ha there is a good ground, solid ground in education that active learning is most effective. Let's think about active learning as a design principle. Active learning methods, however they are designed, help students engage in active thinking and doing. So problem-based learning is an active learning teaching method. Okay. It is the most student-centred of all of the active learning methods. It focuses much more on making explicit the student learning. But there are many other good methods for active learning. One of these is team-based learning, which we have commenced uh, in, at Flinders. Team-based learning is a type of learning which includes a term you may be familiar with, the flipped classroom. And what happens is uh, students do a lot of preparation before they come to their group work. But team-based learning is more structured and more teacher-driven than problem-based learning. Don't worry if you're not taking all of that in. There are textbooks about this. Another form of active learning, which is very, very traditional and popular and very effective in the clinical years, is case-based learning. I think most of you will be familiar with that. In a sense, problem-based learning is like a natural evolution of case-based learning so that we can dig a bit deeper into the scientific and social science um, knowledge and also the other factors around it. Case-based learning and PBL are very similar, but case-based learning is driven by the teacher, the clinician. PBL, the agenda of learning, is sits with the students inside the case and the tutor facilitates their speech. Other sorts of active learning, project-based learning we have, research-based learning. We have simulation scenarios, these are active. Work integrated learning activities and clerkships. So active learning has a good place in most medical schools. I want to turn just briefly to the design of PBL. This is a diagram. Across the world, people have designed different versions of PBL to match their needs. And there are a number of axes. The sort of PBL I will be teaching you is known as problem first. It is the purest form of PBL. And it is the version of PBL used in many universities, McMaster, Harvard, Manchester in England, and there's a lot written about it. But as people are learning more about flipped classroom and are having to have models that are a little bit more um, time efficient for them, many are moving to more uh, information first, where the students must prepare for the PBL. So you can keep this in mind when working out for, for Vietnam, uh, for your PBL, which, uh, where you want to be on that axis. PBL is student 
what we call student led. It is all about the student learning agenda and their learning needs. Other um, active learning methods are more tutor led. And so the, uh, the case-based learning is more uh, in that type. But there is a spectrum. Okay, the other thing is that PBL is very learning focused. It's all about the process of learning. We know the outcomes we want, but we focus more on everything we learn and getting there. But there are other sorts of active learning that are much more outcome focused, where we actually want to get to a particular target. All right, next slide. So now I want to just tell you about the foundations of PBL so that you understand that this uh, learning method um, has a strong basis in psychology and pedagogy. So first, let's consider Barrow's clinical reasoning schema and the PBL tasks. Then I will talk to you about cognitive psychology, the adult learning and collaborative learning. So Howard Barrow, as I told you, was a neurologist, a clinician who wanted to improve the teaching of his students. And he had worked, done some work trying to understand clinical reasoning at that time. Now, many of you who may read on education may think that what we know about clinical reasoning is that it's very context specific. But it seems there is a process, a, gener a generally common process, and this is the process. We start with the presenting complaint. Then we do what we would call our differential diagnosis. But uh, we have called, he has called it the hypothesis. And we have a reason. I think it's this because. But we need to find more information. So we go through a process of inquiry. As a doctor, we may take more history, we will do some more examination, we will do some blood tests, um, and we'll start to prioritise which of those we will do, because we know some tests will change the management, they're the important ones, and we know some tests won't change the management, they're the less important tests. So again, we prioritise. But we get new information, and we synthesise it, and we may do some cycles of refining, but eventually we come to a problem formation, which is we think it's most likely this kind of problem, and then we can act. Okay, start making decisions. So that is one foundation. Let's look then. So the active learning tasks we build into PBL now I've put those same things in Howard's uh, screening um, schema. So from the presenting complaint, the first part of the PBL, we go to what is the key information? What do, then hypothesize, what do we think is going on? And then we go to, well, what mechanisms explain that? What is the physiology? What is the biochemistry? What is the anatomy that we bring to help explain? In the discussion of the information, the hypotheses, the mechanisms, finding new information, we start to identify in the group what we know and what we don't know. And in PBL world, what we don't know becomes our learning issues. This allows the students to be strategic about what they spend their study time on. And they go away and they investigate and they come back and they report back on what they found. Now, I just want to emphasise at this point that it is the report back that is the most important stage of PBL. That is where students bring their new knowledge, they share that new knowledge, they integrate that new knowledge, and they apply it to the patient case right then. So if we think about the active learning tasks that they're doing, again, they are applying knowledge, they are analysing, they are rationalising, they are elaborating. Elaborating means they are building, they are expressing out elaborating what they understand, but they are also building on their own knowledge. They are evaluating what do we think is important, etc. They are researching, 
they are synthesising, they are co-constructing. So it's a very, very active process, but this is all going on in their minds and in their discussion, which is where we see what is in their minds. Please, if anybody needs me to explain anything further, um, I'm happy to take questions at the end. Next, let's think about the constructive, uh, the cognitive basis of PBL. Okay, a PBL case is often, as I said, the student's first case, their first patient, their second patient, their third patient. The case gives context to their learning. It is stimulated by and applied to relevant clinical cases. Students, if their first case is, a, is an R school, is a case of a man, uh, Fred, Eric Sands. Our first case is called Eric Sands. It is a cardiac case. Our clinical students tell us they always remember their first cardiac case. It was the PBL Eric Sands. That is the first case in their clinical database. When they first read the presenting symptom, they're not cardiologists, but it activates what they know. They know things about the heart, they know things about pain, they know things um, about uh, emergencies, they know um, a lot from their families. They've had an uncle who had a heart attack. They bring all sorts of knowledge. Not all of it good, you know, is correct, but they bring all sorts of knowledge to the discussion. And in the small um, group discussion, uh, um, they elaborate. Um, they take part in discussion. I think this. Oh, why do you think that? Oh, I think this because there's this mechanism. Oh, can you draw it on the board? Okay, I'm drawing it. But what's this? I don't understand. So what they're doing is they are speaking out their thinking. I just want to make a point here, which is that um, this presentation of the case and the activation of prior knowledge is often called problem first. So PBL is a problem first kind of active learning. The flipped classroom is knowledge first. And then, so again, this is a point of difference that you can decide which way is most important for you, but we are in favour of, of problem first because of the curiosity uh, Hank Schmidt describes it as epistemic curiosity that is stimulated by the problem. Okay. So just to illustrate this, I'm not from Vietnam, but this creature, I think, may be familiar to some of you. Do people know what this creature is? I think in English it is pangolin. Yeah? So I heard it. Can anybody tell me anything about this creature? Anything? You may be shy in your English, but Piet and Dr. Fu and others are happy to help translate. Tell me something about this. So, it is used as a traditional medicine. This is true. Why is it used as a traditional medicine? The scales. What, do this, what does that mean in traditional medicine? To be strong. The animal represents strength and it has that use in traditional medicine. <laughs> Is there a chemical basis for that? Do we know the pharmacology for that? 
Keratin. Keratin. Okay, so this conversation could have gone a number of ways. Somebody may have told me about its life in the rainforest. I don't know a lot about this creature and I deliberately chose it as something I thought people would know about it. But I can keep asking you questions to find more, to find more. We have just shared some knowledge, perhaps it was common knowledge in Vietnam, but I didn't know that that was the basis of its use in traditional medicine. So I, as a tutor, have learned from you. Yeah. And now, now you're all looking brighter eyed. You see, active, active learning makes us active. Yes. yes. Okay. Is that next? All right. So, I know that I will perhaps be giving you a lot of information here in one hit. But what I hope is that we, particularly those who are doing the training, that we will un we will explore these ideas more. The other concept of problem-based learning and the one that had a lot of um, meaning at Flinders is that it is designed around adult learning principles, um, which is um, initially the work of Knowles, who those of you who are in education know. And the adult learning principles are that adults bring prior knowledge to the group. You all have prior knowledge of the pangolin, which you can share. Adults, um, um, adults will define their learning based on its relevance for them. So you all want to be in some way either be PBL tutors or understand what PBL is about because that's what your students will be doing. Adults are motivated to seek resources to support learning. So any of you, when you don't know something, like how do I, be, how do, I do PBL, will come to a resource like this. You are motivated to find it. Um, you share new knowledge and you apply to the cases that you have. And you also self-evaluate. You're very good at saying, oh, I did this well, but I didn't do that well. Okay, so that is what adult learning does in PBL, and there's a reference there. The next aspect of PBL, which I think really has only has emerged more recently, is that it is a form of collaborative learning. And the people that put together the theory about cooperative or collaborative learning really only started writing in the 19. 90s, but they were drawing on a very old tradition of education, the work of Piaget and Vygotsky. And what Johnson and Johnson say is that cooperative learning, or collaborative learning, is the heart of problem-based learning. Students are working collaboratively in groups, which provides the conditions for healthy, and I'm going to use a lot of big words here, okay, socio-cognitive conflict which creates cognitive disequilibrium requiring reconceptualization and inquiry and in turn results in cognitive development and intellectual growth. So clearly these people have deeply theorized collaborative learning. But if I was to put it in simple words, students share different knowledge and, conscious and, and conceptions about, for example, the pangolin. And then one person says, well, my knowledge doesn't match with your knowledge, so who's right? Oh, disequilibrium. Oh. Well, we can't have disagreement about what is true. They need to discuss and agree what is probably true about what they know. What is actually we're not sure about and what we definitely do not know. Okay. So that's collaborative learning in one side, but there is a lot that you can read about that. So what are students doing during PBL tutorials? They are participating, reading, thinking about the case as it is revealed. They are collaborating, cooperating as a group, helping each other. PBL students do help each other. They soon learn 
who has strengths and who needs weaknesses. You find that students who know a lot about a subject will coach another student who doesn't know a lot outside of the PBL. They form study groups together. They collaborate a lot. They do the PBL tasks, identify information, hypothesizing, mechanisms, etc. They collaborate in knowledge construction, putting their knowledge together to create an understanding that was bigger than they had individually before the tutorial. They find out what they don't know, they identify how to find out, and they prepare for reporting back to the others at the tutorial. At report back, they are explaining to each other, co-constructing a shared understanding. And then we get the next part of the case, which means they've got their new knowledge fresh on the table, fresh on the whiteboards. We go on to the next part. We go on to the next part of the case. Is that better? We go on to the next part of the case. And immediately they get to apply their knowledge. And as a tutor we say, how does this explain that? Okay. What is the tutor doing during PDL? Funnily, at our school, some people thought that a PBL tutor does nothing. We had one PBL tutor who just went to sleep in the tutorial. The students complained bitterly. Okay. Julian and I will tell you that PBL tutorials leave you brain tired. You, you, you have to go and find a cup of tea and lie down for a little while after PBL. It's very tiring. But it's very stimulating. So the tutor is actively listening, allowing the students to puzzle and discuss. If there is a tendency for us to correct too soon or jump in too soon. And sometimes if you let the students correct, they come to the right place. They self-correct and they come to the right place. And at that time, they have their own understanding built into their minds not your understanding pasted into their random access memory to be lost long term, okay? If I can use computer analogy. The tutor is questioning when essential to prompt. So you hear the discussion and you start to think, oh, I think I know what the problem here is. So you might put a little prompting question in, something like, well, what if the patient was... 90 years old, a different type of patient, just to help them suddenly think, oh, okay, now we get where we need to go, just by prompting them. Tutors facilitate inclusion and respect. This is really, really important because when PBL groups first come together, particularly if students come from a competitive environment, they are all jockeying with each other, who's best, who's worst, all of that, etc. Sometimes people are quiet because they think, oh, everybody else knows this and I'm not sure, so I'll just go and look at a book after the tutorial. But as a PBL tutor, tutor you, you watch carefully. You watch carefully. And when a student who is quiet speaks, you look, you look at that student and you nod at them, you give them a signal, and that you're saying, come, speak. And just through doing that, you're communicating respect for that quieter student. Sometimes you need to be more active. A student says something that is hurtful, then you act straight away. Can you think of another way to say that? Okay. So we, we bring about respect. We create a safe learning environment. We prompt students to identify what they don't know. We actually, with, once they're having the discussion and they're getting to a point where, you know, they're not sure, we, we push them. We push, push, push them with questions to get to the point where they say, we don't know and we need to ask a question to find out. better speed along. Okay. Next slide. So the tutor is observing content, how, checking how the PBL tasks are going along, and checking the group process. 
Let us think about the implications for teaching and learning. So PBL is what I would say a paradigm shift. Your students will need permission to learn this way, particularly if they come from an environment where they are not used to speaking up. So the tutor guides this, okay? We know that um, our first PBL, we know as tutors, it's always a little bit stiff because the students are shy. But eventually they come forwards and in a few weeks they look like a completely different group of students. Most importantly, tutors need faculty development to learn how to teach as a PBL tutor. PBL done by a person who does not understand the PBL tutor process can be very um, destructive. Okay. I think I'll skip the issue of expert versus non-expert, other than to say that our experience is that tutors need both content knowledge and must know the PBL process. There is a debate there is a debate about what kind of tutor is best. We find the content expert and the process expert is the most best. We have many tutors who would not call themselves content expert, but because we brief them and they have a science background and they know the knowledge, they are content generalists and they too are very good tutors. The people who are not happy are particularly clinicians who don't understand the PBL process. Then they're like, I can't make sense. So the PBL tutor training is particularly encouraged for those people to help them understand how to facilitate. Also, students need preparation for PBL. So on Saturday, we will be working with your student group. I'm going to talk a little bit about implications for curriculum design. And because time is moving along, um, I'll go a little bit faster than I was going to. So, um, I was going to tell you quite a bit about implementing PBL in our school, but I think at this stage I might leave it um, for now because I have gone a bit slower than I had thought. Um, other than to say, um, we were in a very similar place to where you are today when we decided to do PBL. Um, I have a picture there of a PBL group in Adelaide at Flinders and just to explain to you that um, we've had 20 plus years of successful PBL um, and there's a story about how that success came about but I think perhaps I can share that with um, some of the more senior staff who are involved in curriculum development another time. Just also, the next slide is to. Oh, can you just get through that? Yeah, just pack it on. Yes, I'll show you. We have a curriculum model. A curriculum model which integrates. This is an integrated curriculum model where we integrate um, our principles and practices with our course content and our outcome. And problem based learning is at the foundation. Um, but I will leave that one too because that is more for the curriculum designers. But I do think it's important to show you how an integrated PBL week looks. So at Flinders, we initially implemented a three tutorial PBL case. And here you will see that the students on a Monday finish the last week's tutorial and then straight away start the next case. You'll see they have study time. It is most important in our curriculum to have study time you will see that they have lectures, practicals, and clinical skills time. These are support sessions, and they are all linked to the topic of the PBL case. Um, and then they get a second tutorial, and some more study time, some more support sessions, and so the cycle goes on. I believe, if you forget that here, on, yeah, next. At, in this we have now changed, we changed to a two-step PBL uh, process and I believe that is what you're planning here in uh, Vietnam. There are consequences of that, but that's part of the design. So, the 
PBL case defines the week. The case is defined on the learning objectives and the, stu the students with the tutor's guidance identifies learning issues. So you will hear me talk about learning objectives, that's what the case is designed for, and learning issues, that's what the students um, identify. Let's just click on... Uh, yes, so just to let you know that we have clinical PBL at Flinders in our final two years. Uh, in, um, we, that was our plan. Um, our final year, it was not feasible and we moved to a case-based type of model. But in our second to last year, we have many different models of clinical PBL. Some use paper cases, and the, uh, like for example our surgery rotations, and the surgeons like it because it gives them a basis for defining the curriculum. Others use real patient cases, and they are physicians, they like the students to bring the patient and the student acts as the patient. Oh, I've got a sore throat and such a terrible headache. And the other students have to question them. So it's like the, it's a real version of uh, the PDL without paper. But this, it's based on a real case that the student has seen. You can read about the different sorts of things that we do at Flinders. We have publications. Um, so I'll leave that there. I think the key thing I want to talk about is um, in terms of the implications for curriculum design for you. Um, you need to align the design of PBL you use for the student learning needs at the stage they are. So you might use a different active learning method, me method in year one and two. You might do, um, I think PBL for us, our students at graduate entry, I think that's about your year three, four, five, but we, Julian and I actually think you can do it earlier, but we'll leave that with you. And then there are clinical versions of PBL based on real cases where students also bring their similar cases. Um, and I've, uh, there's a reading I think I gave you by Neil from Manchester where he describes that kind of model and it is very successful. You need to align what you design for your PBL with your assessment. If your assessment is all about rote learning and what do you know, it will dampen PBL. So assessment needs to be at least at the applied level. Um, and uh, it, you can have MCQs that are applied, but also short answer questions, extended math questions, problem solving cases, simulation assessments, those sorts of things. It needs to be aligned to the PBL method. You need to align your model of PBL with your resources. It must be feasible. I think thinking about the feasibility at the beginning is really, really important. Evaluate from the beginning. I'm a student of educational change and I follow the work of Michael Fulham, who is a theorist in that area. And one of his key messages is evaluate from the beginning. Everyone works on starting and goes, ah, oh, Perhaps we should evaluate that, but no, start from the beginning and think not just evaluation, but research and publication. And that is something the Pillow Centre can help with. You need to monitor progress and you need to monitor changes in your context that may change the feasibility of your model. But if you understand active learning principles, you will be able to adapt. And from the beginning, you need to plan for sustainability. So just quickly, how much time have I got? I want to talk to you about sustainability. So let's just go back to, oh yes. Can we go back one? Is there? Yes. Oh yes. So those um, points I gave you about alignments, they're very much what we've learned from our experience at Flinders. There's also a literature, so we go to the next one. Uh, there's a, a review of PBL papers and presentations looking at sustainability by Sami Azir, who has written a textbook on PBL learning. He is a colleague of mine. He's based at the um, Ar 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 Saudi Arabia. And um, he, they looked at all the things that affected the sustainability of PBL. And just quickly, 
You don't have to read all of this. I just want you to know that they digested 12 key points for checking sustainability. They're very similar to what I've already explained to you, but I just wanted you to know that there's a scholarship for this. The implications are uh, uh, just, yeah, we can skip that one. Yeah, that just repeats. So, there is a question about innovation and sustainability. There's a literature about the difference between innovation, which is an event, and innovativeness, which is a process and a culture. You build innovativeness in and you will adapt as things change, your innovations will sustain. But there is research to be done about how that works. So this is a big question. Sustainability is the big question of this century, I think, in many, many fields where everyone's talking about sustainability. But just quickly, if you read the Education and Change Literature, you will see some, some um, useful information. Change is not an event. It's not an engineering exercise. It's not we produce all the materials and we just do it and you do it. It is a complex socio-political process and you are all part of this here um, in Vietnam. And in, innovations need to be fit for purpose. We know this. We know that when innovation is put in place that hasn't been locally tailored to be fit for purpose, it's less likely to succeed than one that has been developed locally. Okay, it must align with culture. The other thing is, and this is why I feel happy skipping the Flinders material on how we achieve change, is the pathway for change is different in every context. The pathway depends on your culture. Some cultures are quite top down, other cultures are quite bottom up. They may or may not be terms, yeah. Um, the other thing is, is that we know that implicate, innovations fail because they're not fit for purpose or adapted to context. You might need to make local sense. And also when evaluation and planning for sustainability is not considered from the, from the beginning. So that would be my key message for all the planners. So, welcome to your journey in PBL. I tried to find a, a, a picture of Vietnam. I, I didn't know where the campus was and I Googled it and I couldn't find it. But, so you need to get on Google. Someone needs to put it there. Um, you are in a very similar situation to where we were when we began PBL. You have a six year school entry. When we introduced PBL, we changed to a graduate entry, MD. I think there are plans for some similar work. I'm not sure. We have two pathways, a six year and a four year. Okay. Similar to you, at that time we had an integrated systems-based pro um, uh, program. We are now trying to shift, and I think PBL aligns with this, to a patient-centred program. The patient as the centre to integrate all of our knowledge. The student as the centre doing the integrating as they are learning. Like you, we have had the sp spiral curriculum. We still have what they call the Z curriculum, where the clear core and science swap over in importance as you go through the course. Um, and, and also similarly, we use the principles of the spices at that time. Uh, so, Julian and I would just like to thank you for um, asking us to come and run a workshop with you. This was your information download. Don't worry, we'll be going through a lot of uh, enacting a lot of this kind of concepts in that workshop. Um, and um, we just like to say we're pleased to be part of it and thank you. I just put the panel in the back there because um, uh, it, I love it, I think it's beautiful. Um, and also because I thought it was a way of saying, are there any questions? Or would you like to have morning tea? Why not? Yeah, no.
Thank you. Very uh, nice presentation about uh, definition and about the role of EBR in the medical education. Uh, let me show uh, uh, in Vietnamese for the Chúng ta vừa nghe một cái bài rất là kỹ, rất là cơ bản đấy. Đây là những người mà họ rất có kinh nghiệm về vấn đề VBL trong giảng dạy y khoa. Thì cái 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 cuộc sống này chúng tôi chỉ có nói với các anh chị như thế này này. Nó có sự thay đổi về đào tạo y khoa trên thế giới. Cái sự thay đổi đó là nó quyết định với cái chương trình, cái cách dạy như thế nào. Và trên thế giới thì nó có hai cái cách. Mỗi cách nó rất là traditional, chúng ta tạm dịch gọi là rất là kinh điển đó là cái chương trình của pháp của châu âu và vân vân các cái thứ nó thường thường kéo dài 5 năm 6 năm vân vân và nó đi là các basic uh, medical science tức là khoa học cơ bản như là sinh lý sinh hóa rồi những cái chuyện này là khác sau học năm nhất năm thứ hai sau đó bắt đầu sang tới là clinical science tức là từ triệu chứng học để đọc bệnh học và điều trị học giống như chúng ta làm và tất cả các trường đều làm trên thế giới như vậy chỉ có cái thời khoảng thôi, 6 năm là khoảng năm Nhưng mà gần đây ta thấy rằng cái việc chia ra như vậy Basic Medical Science tách riêng ra so với lại cái Clinical Science khi đi à, nội ngoại sản nhi tất cả các bộ phần đó Nó làm cho những cái những cái kiến thức về về, về y cơ sở đó Nó không được trải dài cho tới cái khi chúng ta đi lâm sàng Tới khi lâm sàng chúng ta cũng được mai một Những bác sĩ ở lâm sàng thường hay nói về chuyện lâm sàng cũng ít khi nêu nêu lại những cái chuyện rất là liên quan tới y học cơ sở và tới vấn đề sinh học phân tử vấn đề về giờ sinh thì sinh học tế bào vân vân à, ít đấy cũng có một phần là vì các thầy cũng quên rồi cũng xa rồi à, và vì vậy cho nên là hình như hai cái phần đó nó bị tách biệt ra và chính vì tách biệt ra ra cho nên ý thức còn ngược lại những năm thứ nhất năm thứ hai khi học những chuyện đó học giải phẫu học cái cù chó học cái đồ gối nó cũng chả biết nào nó cứ học rất là quen bám tận chỗ này chỗ kia học thuộc lòng nhưng không hiểu cái đó để làm gì tại sao nó để ra cái đó và nó giải trước chức năng gì từ chức năng đó nó ra cái chuyện gì ra cái chuyện gì nó ra cái bệnh lý gì ra bệnh lý gì có triệu chứng gì cái lúc nó bị gãy nó bị cắt thì triệu chứng như thế nào và người ta chữa như thế nào không có một cái nhìn toàn thể về phản hồi bệnh viện đó cho nên trên thế giới nó có một cái cái xu hướng là bây giờ người ta integrate tức là người ta tích hợp lại làm sao cho những năm thứ nhất nó không phải chỉ là vấn đề các y học cơ sở không mà là có rất nhiều kiến thức lâm sản vô thì các chị coi trên thế giới bây giờ những cái bài cuốn sinh lý của gai tân chẳng hạn giống như ngày xưa chúng ta chỉ học như thế nào thôi đây có cô hương nhớ trước gió chỉ học mô tả à, tại sao sốt cơ quan đấy tim đập vân vân tất cả thứ chỉ là sinh lý thôi thì cái xu hướng bây giờ những cái cuốn sinh lý đó họ bắt đầu nói khá nhiều tới các vấn đề liên quan đến bệnh lý nữa à, khi nó bệnh thì như làm sao khi huyết áp nó thay đổi thì nó cao huyết áp vân vân các thứ họ đưa ra khá nhiều và cái integrate đó nó làm cho cái chương trình được gọi là chương trình system based integrated curriculum là chương trình dựa theo tích hợp dựa theo vấn đề à, có lấy ví dụ thì tim mạch chẳng hạn thì không phải chỉ có nói sinh lý tim không người ta bắt đầu đề cập tới cả vấn đề triệu chứng trong tăng huyết áp nguyên nhân của tăng huyết áp và kể cả những phương pháp điều trị nữa về nguyên tắc bởi vì vậy thì cái giới sinh viên thì dần khi nó học bắt đầu nó đã có một vài các hiểu biết hướng dẫn về vấn đề những chuyện bệnh tật và làm và ngược lại cái chương trình này là tới năm thứ sáu thứ sáu vẫn còn có những bài nói về vấn đề sinh học phân tử lúc đó lại nói sinh học phân tử tế bào gốc rồi những cái chuyện gì vân vân vẫn được tiếp tục cho tới năm thứ sáu để cho sinh viên thấy rằng muốn chữa thì muốn đòi chữa thường nhưng phải có những nền tảng nên bản đó là tiến bộ của họ về y học cơ sở vân vân. Thế thì cái đó là một cái thay đổi và cái thay đổi đó có nghĩa tóm lại và khoa y đại quốc gia là một cái đơn vị nó khởi đầu nó tiện hơn các trường khác là khi khởi đầu cái gì thì chúng ta bắt đầu và cứ như thế nó đi lên. À, nó khác cái trường đại học y dược thành phố Hồ Chí Minh ở dược Hồ Chí Minh muốn làm thì các anh chị biết là vì nó đã có một chương trình chạy khoảng bảy chục năm để họ nó y như vậy. Bây giờ muốn chen một cái chương trình mới vô thì phải cuốn chiếu chứ không thể nào và tự động bỏ được và như vậy thì chúng ta biết rằng cái chương trình về tất thế này thì ngoài đại học y học quốc gia gần như là đầu tiên nếu không kể tới cái cái gợi ý tôi nói cho nó vừa vậy của đại học cần thơ đại học cần thơ với sự giúp đỡ của hà lan à, họ đã định làm cái chuyện mua đi đó rồi nhưng mà sau này à, làm được dựa chừng thì làm bị gạt đi bị bỏ đi lại trở lại cái, cái chương trình y như cũ tức là traditional 
và nó sẽ quả thật nó đã bộc lộ ra trên thế giới rất nhiều những cái nhược điểm trong vấn đề đào tạo và do đó cho nên là người ta mới ở đây làm và chúng tôi biết được theo cái uh, cái chương trình uh, của uh, của bộ của ngân hàng quốc tế đó, ngân hàng thế giới đó thì là đại học y dược với rất nhiều các cái trường vào và đại học y dược đã theo cái hướng giống như vậy tức là cấu tạo lại một cái chương trình uh, tích hợp theo vấn đề và cũng kiểu mô đình hóa và điều đó thách thức rất là nhiều tất cả những chuyện này chúng tôi cũng cho rằng thách thức rất là nhiều và không thể nào à, chúng ta đổi ngược nó đâu nó sẽ đem lại những cái rất lợi à, sinh viên đây chỉ nói cho cánh để chúng ta nói vấn đề không làm về sơ linh nó nằm ở đâu trong cái thay đổi chương trình à, cái việc thay đổi này nó đã thay đổi và những cái khóa học của cái khoa y đào quốc gia này ra chúng tôi chưa nói gì đến mức chất lượng hết chất lượng có giỏi hơn hay không giỏi hơn nó không là vấn đề nhưng quả thật à, sinh viên được các bác sĩ ở các bệnh viện nhận định rằng sinh viên có vẻ tích cực hơn có vẻ chịu khó hơn và cái điều quan trọng hình như nó biết nhiều chuyện hơn là các sinh viên của các trường khác hình như nó biết nhiều chuyện hơn à, và có những thầy nói rất hay là chuyện đó đáng nhẽ của trung học cấp một cấp hai tại sao các em biết đó chính là cái anh đó. đó chính là cái việc chúng ta đã đụng đụng chạm tới những chuyện này khá sớm cho nên sinh viên biết biết nhưng mà có thể chi tiết là không biết nhưng bây giờ chúng ta học rồi chúng ta biết chi tiết bây giờ không thể gọi là vấn đề vì chi tiết bây giờ có rất nhiều sách vở có bấm máy lên nên những cái internet vân vân các thứ rất là nhiều chi tiết nên cái cuối cùng là cái tư duy thì đấy là một cái mà chúng tôi thấy là, là nó đạt được cái chuyện mà chúng ta làm thì con đường nó đi như vậy thì khi thực hiện cái chương trình này đó thì dần dần cũng nổi lên là phải active lên lên rõ ràng là cái chị cộng đồng cộng đồng đồng tình với tôi là một trong vấn nạn của cái giáo dục của việt nam đấy chính là từ chưa cái cách thầy học dành từ hồi nhỏ à, ở nhà là mẫu giáo mẫu giáo trồi non trồi già đến lớp một lớp hai đã đã từ chưa rồi tại vì tôi chứng kiến rất nhiều cảnh mẹ cho nói thứ sau khi sửa chén xong bắt đầu có cái vụ nó gọi là dò bài cái vụ dò bài có nghĩa là nếu con đó buồn ngủ muốn chết thức dậy đọc lại thật kỹ tất cả các cái bài không thiếu một chữ cứ sai một chữ là ăn cái tát sai một chữ cũng phải là ăn một cái bậc và, và như vậy cái đứa bé đó là nó học rất là kỹ học rất giỏi và nhiên những em bé gái học giỏi hơn những bé trai của mình nó chậm hơn từ lên tới năm thứ nhất rồi các anh chị nghĩ là đi sinh viên các anh chị này bây giờ là là học học thành có phải là đến cũng vừa trở ra nghe bài là trở bài ra chép 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 cái lúc thi cho một bài cho một bài trong ra câu rồi nói 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 càng trả lời đúng cái cái cái, cái ý của cô giáo thì điểm càng cao à, và như vậy chẳng có cái khác gì có những cái vừa đọc ra sao không thầy ơi sao nói cô cô giáo này thầy đang đi nước ngoài mà tại sao lại sao để thi tức là đoán cả chuyện đó và thứ hai nữa là thầy ơi cái cái câu này là câu của thầy thầy bạn hay là phụ cô nhiên tức là cũng phải hỏi xem thầy nào để phòng trợ ra à, và chúng tôi nói cái đùa với thầy chị rồi tôi không được phép nói nhưng mà thôi tôi hiểu cái chuyện rồi thì cái câu này là của thầy bạn đó để các anh chị khỏi lấy lộn băng khỏi lấy lộn băng có nghĩa là trả cho cái gì thì trả cái đó trả cái gì đó trả lại chính trả từ nào thì nhiều điểm từ đó và cái đó nó bộc lại từ bộc lộ nhiều điểm là cứ như thế thầy nói a thì a thầy nói b thì b thầy nói là nếu náo thì là ra nếu náo thầy nói là không mỹ luận thì cứ nó không mỹ luận ví dụ này tức là nó học đến cái mức độ nó vô trong đầu và nó nguy hiểm khi khi ra bác sĩ xong thì làm việc khi đụng tới những chuyện đúng như các thầy thì đúng nhưng đụng tới chuyện không đúng như các thầy gần như là đúng tốt hoàn toàn không biết để làm thế nào để tìm ra cái gọi là problem solving đó thì chứng kiến chúng tôi là những người đã thừa hưởng hoặc là sử dụng các cái sản phẩm do trường đặt ra thấy rất rõ những việc đó và vì như vậy bên cạnh cái chuyện về ngoại ngữ chúng ta không nói cái cảm giác lên thì cái chuyện và cái thiên kinh đó tức là những tư duy cách nghĩ v vân rõ ràng phải thay đổi và cái thay đổi đó nó sẽ giúp cho các bạn đó về sau này từ từ học lên có điều kiện v v sẽ đi xa hơn cái đường rất khó và chính vì những chuyện đó cho nên là cái chuyện mà thay đổi cách học active learning và còn active teaching thì thôi chúng ta cũng nói nói về các thầy giỏi và cũng trong đụng với các thầy hôm nay để ngồi tập các thầy nhưng mà active và learning thì chúng ta thấy có vấn đề và sinh viên đến các bắt đầu giảm chắc đó thầy đó nói gì ghi cho đúng ghi cho đủ để trả lời cho đủ thì cái active learning đó là một cái hướng nó sẽ làm cho người người sinh viên có khả năng tự học và tự vươn lên tự giải quyết vấn đề sau này 
Thế thì trong cái hãng tin gần đây nó nhiều thứ lắm Và hai đứa này chúng ta cũng nói Nhưng mà có cái chúng tôi thấy Thấy, thấy người đó chính là phố bệnh về Sơn Ninh Và team về Sơn Ninh Tức là team về thì không kể Và phố bệnh về Sơn Ninh Bản thân tôi là người dạy học Bản thân tôi là người cũng đã đi học Cũng dạy học Cũng đã trải qua Cũng đã kê sở study Tức là mình là này Đến giờ phân công có người bệnh nhân và tám giường số mấy đó về bên đầu đội bếp ba làm bệnh án đi các em làm bệnh án lên trình bệnh tức là gọi là trình bệnh giống như chúng ta đã làm bao nhiêu hôm nay tốt không tốt chứ tại vì khi mới bàn những chuyện này có thể nói là bây giờ có cậu cứ vớ vẩn cứ, cứ như ngày xưa đi và dạy như ngày xưa cũng cha những người tốt như cậu hoặc là tôi đây này và con giáo sư cũng tốt đó đâu có cần gì đâu đâu cần phải test đâu có cần phải làm câu trắc nghiệm đâu có phải phải cái chuyện problem based learning làm gì cứ dạy như vậy đi à, thì cũng ra những người tốt như này nhưng lại đi đến đấy là tốt người khi nó ít khi những vấn đề nó chưa nhiều mà càng ngày các chị đấy càng ngày càng nhiều và nếu chúng ta nghĩ tới chuyện kia thì problem based learning theo tôi tôi nghĩ rất là đơn giản thôi các anh chị thấy nếu mà case study từng cá bộ chúng ta chỉ chọn được một ca thôi và cái ca đó cái người nào học được nhiều nhất chính là cái khổ chủ là cái thằng sinh viên mà nó bị phân công làm bệnh án đó là nó học được nhiều nhất là vì nó phải coi bệnh nó phải coi phải làm rồi sau đó thì ông thầy bắt đầu ông đi à, gọi là đi để chạy sổ đâu đó quay trở về à, trình đi trình 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 mấy cái em dưới cũng có đứa đứa nó kháng có đứa hoàn toàn không kháng cái ca đó hoàn toàn là rất là rất là cá biệt không có vấn đề thế thì đi một đợt bao nhiêu ca có thể chỉ được trong vấn đề chúng ta không làm được hết và chúng ta không truyền tải được và đặc biệt tất cả những em khác ngoài các em chỉ bài đó hoàn toàn rất bị động nghe thôi à, ừ, 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 nghe rồi thầy cũng nói vài câu và ông thầy đã áp đặt rất là nhiều tức là ông thầy đó nổi máu lên tôi cũng vẫn nổi máu bây giờ tôi dạy video tôi vẫn bị ngứa 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 miệng tôi nói sai một chút xíu là mình nổi điên nên mình bắt đầu nó hoàn toàn sai tại vì cái mục đích của những cái này là motivate tức là kích thích cho học sinh nó thấy được nó biết cái gì nó chưa hiểu cái gì nó hiểu sai cái gì sau đó tự nó về nó tìm tự nó đọc tự nó nó hiểu tự nó nó có thể nó gọi là tranh luận với nhau để nó ra vấn đề và chúng ta giúp nó chuyện đó chứ chúng ta không thể nào nhét của nó đầy đủ tất cả chuyện để mai mốt khi nó ra bác sĩ nó có thể với những cái chuyện của các chị mà nó nhỏ có những chuyện khi nó nó ra trường nó đã không còn uh, còn đúng được rồi nó đã có thể không đúng được à, thời tôi mà chữa rác rẻ tá tràng thưa thầy rác rẻ tá tràng mà nói cho kháng sinh thì chắc là không biết tôi tôi không đánh trường đâu tại vì cái thời tôi đã ghê giờ thì chắc là đánh trường đâu bảo với bác sĩ là bây giờ có bây giờ thì là nó là helicobacter pylori à, ví dụ vậy đó, nó hoàn toàn khác đi một thời đó nếu mà bằng sinh viên nói về chữa rác rẻ tá tràng bằng trường sinh thì chắc là bị đánh trường bây giờ nó có những cái nó thay đổi và như vậy thế này chúng tôi chỉ xin nói rằng làm rất hay những cái bệnh án đó là những bệnh án rất quan trọng những bệnh án khá điển hình những bệnh án tước xây tới những vấn đề mà chúng ta cai trị muốn truyền tải nhiều và cái quan trọng nhất là khi làm cái này kích thích sinh viên ở nó đọc này nó, nó có những chữ gì những cái tranh từ gì những khi vua cửa gì cần phải thảo luận sau đó nó thảo luận cái gì chúng ta chỉ gợi ý thôi và có thời gian để nó về đó nó làm rồi sau đó nó chỉnh lại cái lúc quay trở lại chỉnh lại nhóm này ganh tìm nhóm kia nhóm này đưa ra được những cái bảng gai lai mới thậm chí cả gai lai của việt nam làm như thế này nước ngoài và như vậy chúng ta có thể tóm tắt à, lẽ đương nhiên rằng à, nói như vậy thì về nguyên tắc rất là dễ hiểu chứ nói với các anh chị nói là thầy nói vậy em cứ hiểu chứ ai cho làm được nhưng mà chúng ta thấy đây rất nhiều vấn đề trong đó trên thực tế có những vấn đề thế này một là thành phần của PBM trong cái 6 năm của chúng ta trong 6 năm này rất nhiều thầy cô trong cái mô đuyên ví dụ mô đuyên hô hấp của cô Huyên của đó cô Huyên rất muốn đưa vô nhưng mà khi học trò nó mới năm thứ nhất năm thứ hai nó chưa biết nhiều quá nó chưa biết nhiều thì những PBM đó chúng ta phải là soạn lại khác là tính chất và số lượng lại khác nhưng mà tới năm thứ năm tư năm năm thứ tư và năm thứ sáu khi đi nội ngoại sản nhi đó thì có lẽ PBL phải làm tăng nhiều lên thêm và biểu đó nó có khá nhiều rồi à, thầy làm nhiều thêm nhiều thêm thì nó vì nhiều việc cho các thầy tại vì trước kia các thầy lên ca một bài à, giống như bài tăng huyết áp bây giờ tôi 12 giờ đánh thức tôi dậy tôi dậy được ngay 45 phút không thiếu chữ tại vì nó thuộc rồi nhưng mà sổ ra như vậy trong 45 phút như vậy 
thực sự mình chỉ nói cho nó sướng miệng mình thôi chứ người trước kia nghe thì nó nghe nữa nghe nữa thở thở không và cái truyền tải của đó là nó rất bị động còn bây giờ đó một cái bài đó có khi phải thành ba buổi là vì một buổi nói về nhà về về, về nhà cho em thời gian thời gian nó bị thay đổi rất là nhiều và như vậy thì cái chuyện mà chúng ta làm sao mà được cũng là vấn đề và vì vậy cho nên chúng tôi thấy là có nhiều vấn đề lắm ví dụ có vấn đề chúng tôi nói với họ họ cũng chịu luôn là ở các nước là anh chỉ biết đi ra nước ngoài chúng ta làm video sau khi đưa đưa về nhà lên và bạn có hỏi chị không phải nói sinh viên đứa nào cũng giơ tay người đứa ngồi trong đứa, đứa này thì giơ tay hỏi cái này đứa kia giơ tay hỏi cái kia đứa này hỏi cái này có vấn đề liên quan đến kia nữa không không tức là cái khả năng gọi là tích cực và cái, cái động tái tích cực và nó thì cũng rất là làm việc cho nên rất sôi động không mất thời gian rồi anh có thể lái nó qua cái này lái không có rất là thích muốn gọi cho nó để cho nó cãi nhau mình lái cái này qua chút xíu là bắt đầu nó đứng lên nó nói còn ở đây nói thật với các anh chị có những lớp sau khi hỏi xong có gì không thì không ai có ý kiến hết không ai kia nó không nói nhưng mà chút xíu nó nói rằng nếu mà nói như vậy tao nói cũng được nhưng mà tao không bao giờ nói hết tao im im không nói không phát biểu không thắc mắc thế thì làm gì các chị làm gì gọi tên cũng chỉ cũng gọi tên mà gọi tên thì nó mất cái tính chất đi của của chủ động thôi à, và sau đó thì là các chị này gọi là bực quá thấy có các chị nói luôn ở thế này thế này thế này rồi xong rồi về chuẩn bị 3 ngày 3 ngày đó tất cả người đó hoặc bốn chục người đó nó có đều đi cô vô trong phi tính có vô trong uh, trong uh, sách nó 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 không không lại là chuyện khác nữa và rồi sau đó thì ba ngày sau họ họp trở lại họp trở lại thì có đại diện của một cái nhóm đó đứng lên nói đến như cô uh, đây thì phải nói rằng đại học y dược đã thấy chuyện này từ lâu rồi đại học y dược đã cử một nhóm ở đây có cô lợi là một trong những người trong cái nhóm đó là quá UCSF để học vấn đề PPM nhưng mà cũng nói nói rằng là còn nhiều cái để chúng ta có thể thảo luận với đây ở đây và để thấy rằng rất nhiều vấn đề nó không nói gì cả nên lúc mà đến kia cũng chỉ có một hai cái nó nói như vậy là trong một nhóm nó không nói gì cả và có bốn năm uh, em thì rất là tích cực cái gì cũng chưa tay để nói nhưng mà khi nói thì cái nào cũng sai hết à, nói sai rất nhiều thế thì các chị cho mấy cái đứa đó là điểm tích cực nhưng mà điểm cao hay điểm thấp à, còn mấy đứa nó ngồi không nó mắt mắt nó liếc 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 này này tức là không phải nó không biết nó không biết đấy ra chỉ định nó để đứng lên nói được nhưng mà nó giơ tay thì không đòi tay thì các anh chị cho nó mấy điểm mấy thật có đến 10 lần chuyên gia như này cũng chịu không thể đánh giá được và vấn đề nó là cho nó nó là cái 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 đặc điểm của học sinh 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 viên việt nam nó khác với nước ngoài các anh chị làm nước ngoài chất lắm tôi đã từng làm cái đó ở bên đức ở bên mỹ và tôi dự những cái khóa đó ở bên singapore thì chúng nó cứ lấp nó một thằng mà nó nói bên kia nó nói ra là bên nhóm bên này giơ tay liền họ thời gian nó, 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 nó rất là năng động rất là thích và như vậy rất thích rất dễ lái để cho người ta tranh luận với nhau ở việt nam thì không ha? cũng uh, nhìn nhìn à, có biết không biết chút xíu ra hỏi tại sao mà em không nói thì thôi em thấy nó cũng được để cho thôi thầy nói hay đâu là cách cái cách suy nghĩ của mình cũng là thế thì giờ xin vấn đề như này thì uh, các anh chị học tin chúng tôi nghĩ rằng không thể có được nào khác chắc chắn chỉ có cái chương trình khi chúng ta thay đổi như thế nào thôi nhưng mà rồi chúng ta sẽ bàn về số lượng của các PPM làm trong năm thứ nhất, năm thứ hai, năm thứ năm, năm thứ sáu phải tăng lên như thế nào. Chuyện thứ hai nữa đó là cái chuyện mà gọi là à, huấn luyện Twitter thì chúng tôi cho rằng cái này không thể nào không thể huấn luyện được. Tại vì rất nhiều thầy, chúng tôi rất tôn trọng các thầy dạy case study, trình bày rất giỏi, không có rất, rất nhiều khỏi về nói. Nhưng mà đến lúc chuyển sang cái này thì phải huấn luyện và chưa kể rằng huấn luyện đó bây giờ các chị một mình các chị thì chị lợi không thể làm hết cuối cùng phải là các bạn em trẻ những em trẻ đó làm muốn đúng cái ý của mình đúng cái phương pháp bắt buộc phải có uh, twitter và các chị thấy từ twitter làm cái gì uh, làm cái gì tính cách như thế nào đó là phải có và chưa kể rằng uh, theo bài đó còn tôi làm thế này buổi đầu tiên thì tôi làm tức là cái buổi đầu tiên thì tôi đứng ra nói cái bệnh án đó xong đó gợi ý đang hỏi gì không chữ này chữ kia hiểu gì không vân vân là tôi có một xong sau đó thì bắt đầu chia bốn chục em đó chia thành bốn nhóm bốn nhóm đó sẽ có hai viên tiếng trẻ giúp thằng gọi là thảo luận chung để chúng nó thảo luận nhau nhưng mà theo của người này đó thì các anh chị đã là họ chia luôn bốn nhóm ban đầu và bốn cái tờ đó đều làm giống nhau hết 
Thế là hỏi cái gì, thích thích cái gì, nói tới đâu Không nói quá, đều làm được nhau hết Thì đấy, đấy là làm một cái thách thức Ở đây chắc không thể làm nổi rồi Vì một, một cái buổi, một cái case Mà làm bốn Twitter Để cho mỗi Twitter làm từng nhóm một À, cho đến cuối cùng khi cái ngày cuối cùng thì họ đồng ý ngày cuối cùng có thể là tập trung lại à, số một số nhưng mà như vậy phải như thế và chính vì lý do đó cho nên chúng tôi đấy là họ phải mời các chuyên gia ở đây đến làm à, cũng xin nói với các anh chị không phải là dễ đâu tất cả nguyên tắc để hiểu lựa gọi là làm cái gì để hiểu nhưng mà đến lúc làm thật ở trên cái uh, sinh viên đó và làm thế nào cho hiệu quả thì đến đây là vấn đề rồi còn một cái nữa thì một cái nữa là những cái ca đưa ra đưa ra kê những cái kê chuyên nhân kê rồi đó chúng ta phải sẵn chứ cái đó nó là cả một công trình rất là kê không thể nào lấy ra được một cái ca được và như vậy soạn ai sẽ soạn bao nhiêu lâu chúng ta sẽ có được tất cả tất cả các cái kê đó cái kê đó nó vừa mang tính chất sư phạm vừa mang tính chất thực hành vừa mang tính chất rất là thực rất là đời thường mới được thì mới, mới tốt thì mới thỏa thuận được thì cái đó là cũng là vấn đề à, chúng ta có nên học gọi là học lõm không? Xin Flinder à, Ông ở Tiên Mạnh cũng có 10 kê cho tôi yên à, Cũng được, chúng tôi đã có là xin Nhưng mà cũng có những trường người ta nói đấy là hoàn toàn là à, có tính chất nhận nhận vào à, Authority đó, tức là không không có được Họ rất muốn cho nhưng không được Nhưng tôi nghĩ rằng chúng ta phải soạn Tại vì muốn cho những cái kê thực hành này nó thực hành Để cho các em sau này nó thảo luận trước Thì phải là những kê tương đối xứng cho hoàn cảnh của Việt Nam À, của bệnh nhân đây bạn cũng đưa ra một cái họ lao những đạo vân vân các thứ rồi bệnh nhân bị làm ruộng chứ các thứ thì có biết đâu chứ nếu mà lấy một cái ca mà của bên mỹ hoặc là bên châu âu thì có khi là không tốt thì đấy soạn cái đó cũng là cả vấn đề xin các thầy chú ý rồi không phải đơn giản đâu còn vấn đề cuối cùng nữa là vấn đề chuẩn bị về phía sinh viên nữa à, thì chúng tôi có một buổi riêng để cho các thầy các cô này làm việc với sinh viên nói xem cái để các học áp tìm lợi ninh làm sao à, vấn đề là gọi là critical thinking critical thinking chữ đấy là hay lắm mà chúng ta bây rất kém đó là vấn đề tư duy phản biện à, thì hình như là chúng ta tư duy phản biện thì chữ ít nhất hoặc cái gì gọi là phản biện là thực dấu dấu trong đầu còn ít khi dám nói ra thì tất cả cái chuyện đó sẽ làm cho sinh viên vào ngày thứ bảy à, chuẩn bị cho sinh viên một cách nào nhưng mà về phía về phía uh, trường và các trường khi có làm đó đó ở đây có trường đại học y dược thành phố hồ chí minh chúng tôi nghĩ rằng tất cả trường này phải chuẩn bị và ngày ngày hôm nay thì có 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 riêng hẳn và chúng ta chỉ có buổi sáng hôm nay với lịch sáng thứ sáu là có tính chất hơi lý thuyết giới giới thiệu về pbm chung và vân vân sau đó thì có nhóm riêng sẽ làm việc trong suốt tuần là các twitter đây ở đây những nguyên chức chương trình dịch là gì các bạn làm gì trẻ giỏi à, ở đây trong sách này dịch là giảng sư thì tôi thấy chữ giảng sư nghe không được đấy giảng sư hình như là để cho dạy học ở nhà thì có à, gia sư hay giảng sư à, twitter mình gọi là giảng viên thì là mình chẳng 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 cạnh với giảng viên và thì mình cứ lấy chữ twitter đi twitter cũng là một người à, được được à, học đặc biệt và được tra ninh đặc biệt để mà điều khiển tất cả các bậc phim em các anh chị thấy rất hay và không đồng nếu mà làm được tốt cái chuyện này chúng ta sẽ trở thành những cái chuyên gia à, luôn luôn làm những cái này và làm và rất cần sự đóng góp của tất cả các bác sĩ ở tất cả các bệnh viện thực hành à, thì cái này thực thường nó sẽ lan ra các bệnh viện thực hành nữa những cái mà gọi là trình bệnh như ngày xưa đã đã đổi cách chúng ta làm thành PBL như vậy thì rất là tốt anh chị thay vì chẳng một buổi chọn bệnh nhân thì có một bệnh án bệnh án đó anh chị gợi ý sau đi gợi ý cho anh về đọc gợi ý cho nó về đọc đi đừng quên cái lai của hội tiêm mạch Việt Nam nhớ vân vân à, sau đó thì hai ngày gặp lại và khi gặp lại đó thì nó nói lên em đã đọc cái này em đã đọc cái kia của tôi của anh và cái chị chỉ điều chỉnh lại chút xíu nữa thì sẽ trở thành tôi nghĩ rằng đó là cái cách rất là tốt để mà điều chỉnh cái cách dạy như chúng ta làm được trước đây đó là trình bày cho chúng ta nhân cái trình bày đó thì đấy là ý kiến và chỉ vì vậy cho nên thì em là một trong những biện pháp chỉ là một trong những biện pháp của cái chuyện tăng cường tự tự tự, tự chủ và tự tự quản trong hoạt động an ninh lần này À, có khá nhiều vấn đề chưa kể là phòng bốc nữa anh chị đừng tưởng là chỗ nào đó không có phòng bốc bởi vì cái này là phải làm chia nhóm nhỏ là phải có phòng phòng nó phải có bàn ghế có uh, bàn bàn lăng co có thậm chí là cả cái thứ để cho các em nó viết và làm thì uh, cái gì cũng rất khó 
Thế thì bắt đầu cũng rất là khó Chúng tôi nghĩ là đây là xu hướng tốt Và cho nên muốn nói thêm một câu Để gây nó như vậy đó Một lần nữa Tất cả các chuyện định diện để dạy học Các thầy đây rất rành à, Nhưng mà trong đây là một sự thay đổi Cái sự thay đổi này đòi hỏi phải có những cái là Chúng ta cùng phải thống nhất với nhau Theo cái uh, quốc tế Và cùng training và thì những cái người Twitter lần hôm nay được training cho con trainer đó thì những người đó sẽ làm bệnh nhân và sau này sẽ mở rộng cái này và rất mong ví dụ như anh nên ở bệnh viện dân sau này các bác sĩ đó cũng nên chạy vào kiểu đó thì tôi thấy nghĩa rất hay thừa sức làm chúng ta thừa sức làm nhưng mà làm cái kiểu này nó sẽ làm cho sinh viên nó tốt hơn nó chủ động hơn nó soạn và nói thật với các chị nó mà soạn ra tài liệu này tài liệu kia và tới ngày quay trở lại các chị không biết đó, là cái đó là kích thích thích các thầy chứ không phải không bởi vì nếu các thầy không đọc các thầy thấy họ nói nó tra sạch này sẽ kia không phải là tra sách bệnh nữa chắc tra sạch cái thời mà thầy không biết nữa thì các thầy cũng phải có cái cách đọc bệnh lên có nghĩa rằng đó là cũng tác động qua làm thì không thì đấy là chúng tôi uh, uh, những cái bài của, uh, của, của bà có thể nói để được các anh chị uh, những tất cả các cái uh, bệnh viện khác định hướng thực sự à, bây giờ là break hay là à, à, xin lỗi là nói tiếng về cái việc vậy bây giờ các anh chị có hỏi gì của bài của bà rồi vâng thì xin các chị hỏi bằng tiếng việt hoặc là bằng tiếng anh luôn I have one question for you so uh, I I would like to know what challenge Uh, we would like to know what challenges when we can encounter uh, in uh, applying uh, PBL teaching in clinical context. So, I'll take it. sure I understand your question. So you were asking, I think, what challenges that we experienced implementing PBL in the clinical environment. That's right. That's a very good question. Um, I think for us, the first challenge we had was that um, at that time in the 1990s, Not many people were using PBL in the clinical environment. At that time, it was still very much conceived as a classroom activity. And I think at that time, uh, people hadn't thought about its basis as a method of um, making students think yeah, actively. And so it was hard for our clinicians to gain an understanding of what PBL was. I think the second challenge we had was um, that because of the McMaster experience with PBL, they had, as people did in the 1970s, decided to be very radical. And they said, anybody could be a PBL tutor, you could get a person off the street and they could be a PBL tutor just so long as they could ask questions. I think that was a very problematic concept and I personally disagree with that. And in fact, McMaster have changed, they came to us at Flinders to learn how we did PBL because we did not follow that philosophy. So for the clinicians, their first idea about PBL was that their specialised knowledge didn't matter. They said, why should I be a clinician sitting in a PBL room? What use is my knowledge? Well, I know, and many of us know, who are, have a clinical background, who do PBL, is that your knowledge is the key to your excellence as a PBL tutor because you know, you know the field, you know the territory, you know the good concepts, you know the traps, the pitfalls. And so you are an intelligent listener of the student discussion 
and you are also an intelligent selector of the right question because you know where they need to go. In our clinical, the other thing is that our clinicians struggle with, but students really want to have my know-how, not my knowledge, not my didactic declarative knowledge, my know-how, we call it praxis, um, about how I go about being a clinician. And at that time, that kind of knowledge wasn't built into PBL. But over the years, there have, there have been PBL models built more suited to clinical, where um, once the students have explored the case and have um, shown what they understand, the clinician can then come in as somebody who knows how and can help the students understand how this works in practice. So um, we have um, clinicians who teach PBL who are enthusiastic about PBL and at the end of the tutorial will lead into know-how and share their clinical experience of many other similar cases. The other um, model in PBL, which is the good one they do in Manchester, it's run very much by their general practitioner department, is that the students bring um, do a PBL case that's been defined for the curriculum, but the students must bring examples of other cases they have seen in the clinical so that they can say, well, in this case we did this, but in that case I did that. So I saw this in this case. Why was that? Why was this case different to that case? Why did they use an evidence-based protocol here, but not here? So they were able to build the sophistication of knowledge. You couldn't do that if you were not a clinician. So I think this is why developing your models for your context, making sense for you as clinicians is so important. Um, I just did my PhD on that area, so. <laughs> for your very interesting presentation. But in Vietnam, we have one other problem. It is a big class. Yes. Yeah, a big class. Yes. For example, in VNU, we have small class, but 120 students. Yes. And we have not enough small uh, room for small group. Yes. So uh, as in OBGYN department, that we apply the PBL for our students. We have to uh, use a rather big group. Yes. The smallest in Chinese student. Yes. Smallest Chinese yes. student, and we have to activate them. So uh, uh, please thinking about the uh, how to help us activate our student in a rather big class. Thank you. Yes. So this is one of the feasibility issues. The first thing I would do, okay, so everyone knows that the bigger the group gets, the more difficult it is for everybody to be included in the dialogue. And some students will become what we in Australia call passengers. They're just along for the ride, but they're not actually getting involved. And so that is a worry when you're trying to stimulate active learning. So when you, in thinking about how you want to do PBL, think very seriously, and I, I think I would ask you to think out of the box, who can be your PBL tutors? Can your departments be supplemented with you know, dedicated tutor, tutors who may be um, a generalist who can have has sufficient knowledge in your specialty. That's one thought. Okay, so one side of the equation is 
to create enough tutors who can teach. For example, I was a generalist in my school, um, and I would be called on as the emergency tutor for the different disciplines, surgery, medicine, ONG, pediatrics. And I could tutor in any of those because I had a medical degree, I had a broad knowledge, I had um, uh, uh, trained in the general pathway um, before I went into medical education. Um, and so none of the content at the student level was difficult for me. I still had enough knowledge to prompt and push and know where they needed to go. Some people say if you are too specialised, you want to push them too narrow. So, you know, this is why knowing the PBL process is so important. So the first side of the equation is consider how you can have enough tutors to have a smaller group. Once you're beyond about 12, it's really begin it, it really is hard to engage all the students in the discussion and have the dynamic. The alternative is to look at models of um, PBL hybrids, if you like, where they can adapt to larger groups. Your own dean has showed us yesterday a model that he has to do a large group, some small groups, and then a large group. Yeah, and some medical schools do that. One in Australia that does that model is in Wollongong. So they have a large group case presentation. The students can ask us questions. They go off and, and study, then they come together for a small group to really work through the case just for one tutorial. So the numbers of tutors you need, you might get more tutors prepared to do just that one bit. And then they come back to the big tutorial where they feed back everything together and uh, synthesize. So it's possible to do large group models. They're hybrids and there's always a compromise. And so it's deciding what compromises you are prepared to live with. Um, yeah. Wollongong School is only 70 students as well. That's it. So our school, when we started PBL, was a similar size, 120 every year. We are a bit bigger now, 160. Next year will be 190. So, uh, yeah. Um, it, it, working out the model for how you are going to do your tutors is actually a big part of the feasibility. Um, in our school, our dean said everybody is going to be a PBL tutor. Um, and you can do the maths, you know, you can do the accounting, uh, work an economic model. Um, I think it would be a good area for study. Yeah. Thank you for your question and answer sections. Uh, uh, everyone, we, uh, it's time for us to have a short break yeah, before we move to the next uh, topic. It's a very interesting topic, it's related to active learning. Active learning in the perception of our other teachers. Yeah, it is the way to connect to the, the, the perception of our students when they think about active learning. It's a very important topic. Thank you. And please have a uh, tea break. Uh, in uh, 15 minutes. In 15 minutes. What we need is to fully understand your problem. Okay? Um, we have done a presentation to you with many, many, many different concepts. We have not yet done the full PBL workshop to take you through the process of PBL. So, in order to make sure that in the PBL workshop, we actually do address your concerns. We would like to use this session to invite you to share your challenges so that Julie and I can start thinking about it. I would also like to invite you to share some of your successes. So um, don't be shy. Um, I think, you know, I have to congratulate the VNU for um, the work you've already done trying over the last 10 years to do a type of PBL learning. And the problem that was put to me is that there's been a gradual understanding 
that there are many challenges and we don't all have the same idea of what PBL is. So the idea in this workshop is to help you clearly um, understand what is critical in making something a PBL. And if those elements are not there, don't call it PBL. Okay. So some people have already spoken to me about some sessions they run and really they are clinical tutorials. The difference is, the, the big thing is problem first. The problem stimulates the discussion. If they've already been to a big lecture and information centre and then they go to a tutorial to generally discuss it, well then it's a tutorial about the information and lecture session. It's not actually a PBL. So what I hope is that gradually you'll get a stronger idea of what PBL is so that you can decide how this will work for you in your curriculum. Can I just bring up one issue first, just to get the conversation going? So there was a few people that came and spoke to us in the break. Is, is it alright if I use your challenge? Can I use your challenge? So, the challenge, can I know your name, sorry? Your name is... Maya. Thank you, Maya. So Maya was telling me that... Um, it's nice to meet you, Maya. Um, she's organising a programme of tutorials and they've decided there are four topics. And um, she's trying to work out how to get the different tutors working um, to do the topics so the students get the same learning. But one of the challenges is that the specialist thinks they can only do the tutorial in their specialist case. Even though all the topics are in the same field of medicine, and even though the specialist knowledge is up here, and the student knowledge only needs to be here, they do not feel confident to teach the other topics because it's related but not their actual specialty. And we had this problem too at Finders. Um, and so the, dis the different clinical groups had to talk about their comfort zone, their comfort in teaching beyond their absolute specialty. So for example, our, our um, internal medicine group, the key tutors um, who lead are a cardiologist, the head of the cardiology department, and a gerontologist, the head of the gerontology service. And they teach all the topics in internal medicine because it keeps them curious and alive, keeps their knowledge fresh, and because they are quite expert at the student kind of level enough to guide the students in the tutorials. Okay, so I just wanted to say not every specialty group will agree, and our other at Flinders, the different specialty groups had to work out how they felt about that. Some of them brought in um, dedicated generalists because some specialists feel uncomfortable outside of their narrow zone, but it's a conversation for all of your clinical faculties. So that's that's one um, issue that was brought up. I'm sure there are hundreds more. Um, what I might do, what I think would be good to do, just to get everybody in an active learning framework, is I might ask you for five minutes to turn to the person next to you and discuss what, the what questions you have about PBL or what challenges you see coming forward. And once you've done that, agree with you what question you might put forward. So if I could set the time at five minutes, this is part of, this is a standard active learning technique in large groups. Pair, discuss, share, okay? So pair and share. So if I could, if, if people who are on their own could find a person to sit, twos or threes, doesn't matter, whichever group, but I'd like you to now discuss with each other what you're thinking about PBL, what questions you might like to ask for five minutes.
I think we know already some good questions coming up. So um, think about what question you want to put forward and how to express that. It was a very good question from over here. Um, and sorry, I need to introduce, I'm Julie, and you are Dr. Vin. Yes. Pleased to meet you. Um, so Dr. Vin, this question, let me make sure that I'm correct in the question, is um, how do we make sure, you know, you've got all the different groups doing their PBL cases, how do we make sure that they're able to come to the same place for their assessment? Here in uh, Vietnam, you call it your evaluation. That's, um, we would tend to use the word assessment, evaluation assessment, it's similar. Okay, so, and it's a really good question, and I know that one um, issue within our school is, oh, but all the students have to know the same knowledge. Okay? So, the first thing I want to do is um, to show you through our curriculum model. So, I'm hoping people can read it, and I'm hoping I can find the pointer. Here we go. A PBL curriculum is very carefully constructed. Okay? So, I don't know if it's big enough for everyone to see. There's a yellow box that says course outcomes. So we have a defined set of curriculum outcomes for our course. And we have three themes of knowledge, or three themes of the learning, in, that flows through the course. So we have knowledge and health and illness. We have health profession, society, so that's about doctors and society and personal and professional development. And we have doctor and patient, so all about the skills between doctor and patient. And our PBL cases cover mainly the knowledge of the health and illness, but it's mapped to the course outcomes. So, and but also some health professions in society, again, mapped to the course outcomes, and also the related clinical skills, mapped to course outcomes. And our PBL cases are designed, our PBL cases are designed, they, because it's about knowledge, it tends to sit more in knowledge of health and illness, but we also integrate the social sciences, society parts, public health, and also try and integrate the clinical skills. So every single case is designed to have learning outcomes, learning objectives that come from these three, centred around a patient, a patient case. And the students, the case is designed with a, a, a problem first, a patient presenting, for example, with a fever. Actually, I shouldn't use fever because that's what we're using in the workshop. Patient presents with um, gastro, a gastro, a vomiting, vomiting and diarrhea, and the knowledge domains may be things like fluid and electrolytes, you know, resuscitation and all of that kind of thing. Uh, particularly, if it's a paediatric case, important for hydration. The um, but also we'll dig into things like sodium channels you know, etc. The biochemistry behind it, physiology, pathophysiology, the microbiology, you know, salmonella, shigella, that sort of thing, the anatomy of the gut. Um, and then the health professions and societies might have a learning objective in the case about um, compulsory um, reporting for infectious diseases, you know, and, and infection control and those sorts of things. And the clinical skills side of things might be about assessing dehydration and those sorts of things. Okay, so the case integrators, but they're clear learning objectives for each case and they're mapped to achieving the course outcomes. So you have a very structured curriculum on which your cases are designed. In the clinical years, because we start in the preclinical part, well, it's not really, it's integrated, as you know, like yours, they do clinical and um, basic science 
differences. But in a clinical case, they may take it to a different level. That may be a case uh, where they very much focus on diagnosis, management, and all that kind of thing. And the topic is vomiting and diarrhea, for the tutorial. But it's still a selected topic within the curriculum. It's still mapped to the curriculum. So the students are doing a case. The students are doing a case. And what happens in each group, what happens in each group is that group one, they, they have the case. Okay, they discuss. And the students are saying, well, this is what I know about vomiting and diarrhea and, you know, you have to be very careful about inputs and outputs and weight loss and those sorts of things. Or then they'll work through the mechanisms and people will know a lot about um, um, cholera or shigella or, you know, that sort of thing. So they work out what they know, okay? They know, they know this much of what's got to be covered, okay? So that's good. They know that, okay? In their discussion, they realise that we're not sure about this bit. And we don't know this bit. Okay? We don't know. We don't know. Um, they don't have necessarily the learning outcomes of the case in front of them, but the tutor does. So the tutor is helping them plot out what they know and what they don't know. <clears throat> so they will, just, they, they will do some learning issues around these two, okay? That's group one. Group two actually have a different set of knowledge. They know this bit, but what they don't know are these bits, okay? So group two will end up having a slightly different conversation and they will have different learning outcomes. So although the PBL discussion and the outcomes and the learning issues they come out with are different, um, they have covered all, they've, all of there. They don't waste time going and studying what they already know. And in fact, their discussion has probably reinforced what they already know. They've checked their facts with each other and they know that that's the same for everybody. So does that help explain how we make sure that students are covering the curriculum, both with careful design of cases and mapping to the curriculum for the content. The, the, so this designs the playing field. And this is the game on the playing field. And as you know, every time a soccer team goes out with a competitor like Malaysia, they will play a different game. Tonight you hope they win. We hope. Okay. So the students are playing a game within a field that has been set with rules. The tutor guides them, guides those rules, okay? The PBL case is what sets the agenda, the learning agenda. But the game plays out differently within each group. But at the end of the day, these groups will have matching sets of knowledge, okay? Because they knew different stuff already and they've researched new, the stuff that they didn't know. And that's how, that's how we make sure. The other thing that happens, do, do you want to comment? Yeah, that's okay. The other thing that happens is that the students wander between the different PBO rooms and they see the different boards and they pick up from different groups. And sometimes they have a study group. Some students deliberately have study groups with members from different groups. So there's a whole host of ways in which the students develop collectively the right body, shared body of knowledge. Does that help explain that, that to everyone? We know this works. Um, because we did, uh, when we changed, we had a set of knowledge exams and then after the change we checked against the same knowledge exams and the students performed just as well. They learned the same way. Of course you want them to uh, perform even better and that's another whole question. What we've discovered is they learn better skills. Okay, the, the knowledge is more embedded. Um, so, that's, so that was one question that just came from over here um, to try and um, help you understand. So, you've been discussing. I hope that each of you are prepared to now come forward with more questions that you have about the PBL. So please, do not hold back. I want to hear what your challenges are because we want to make sure that we can address them. Have we got 
are used and as the core of that surgery curriculum. It's refreshed. The topics are refreshed, of course. Okay, so they get to cover a liver case, they get to cover a, a swallowing case, they get to cover a ma major trauma case, you know, etc., etc. They, they do those, so they define the curriculum. Um, the other thing was that they did it in two shorter tutorials, so less time than the full blown model. What that needs to really work is students who already know how to do PBL. It, so we have PBL before they come to the clinical rotation. The students coming into the clinical rotations already know how to do PBL, PBL students. If the tutors in the clinical don't do it the right PBL, the students say, no, that, we're not doing it that way, it's this way. <laughs> they, you know? um, so imagine that. It doesn't go down very well with some specialists. Uh, yeah, so, so it's critical that students are already PBL aware, like they've practiced. So that's your first, is that correct in your first question? How do we, yeah, yeah, that, okay. The second one then is how do you assess? Okay, so what students are learning in PBL is integrated kinds of knowledge around clinical cases. So we implemented a type of assessment called mini case, mini case, okay. There are different sorts of um, ways you can do it. The Canadians use a sort of assessment called a key features assessment, okay. But they're assessments of problem solving and reasoning, written assessments, okay. So you can put that kind of thing in place. The, and also you can use applied multiple choice um, so PBL is mainly in the knowledge domain, but you might have it linked to some clinical domains. So you might also do some clinical cases for your assessments. Um, <laughs> so this is where the alignment with assessment is really important because in the program I worked in, they had a big integrated assessment across the whole year so that um, there was one organised major assessment. Now, that's very stressful for the students, so there's been a move back to breaking it into little pieces, but it's about who you have to help you organise assessments. As long as you know which types of assessments fit with PBL, the ones that are about applying, about problem solving, those sorts of things, then I think you can step ahead. Um, I probably should leave the assessment for there. We have shifted to a new assessment system, but that's a big topic. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Does that help? Yes, it does. It's really helpful. Yeah. <coughs> yes, uh, the, your solution to, uh, uh, to know about the, the, the same outcome in one class, but in uh, our city, there are many, many universities. And just we, uh, if, if, if we, we apply the, the PBL in our, in our university here, and after the graduating, the, the, the student must go continue to go to the post graduate. But the other university don't, uh, don't apply the PBL. So they are different, different, different outcome and so very difficult to our, uh, our student to, to continue the, the study. Okay, so everyone has this concern. This is probably the most concern for schools who have made the decision to go to PBL. Um, firstly, they tend to do, if you were to look at curricula and actually look at the big course outcomes, the ones who are at the end of the course, you will find they're nearly all the same. Because there's no rocket science about what's important to know in medicine. The content we know, okay, changes between here, etc. Our course, we developed our course outcomes. Two or three years later, our Australian Medical Council issued its standards medical education outcomes. They were almost identical. They could have picked up our curriculum and said these are the standards, okay? So that's one thing. Second, the students are a little bit different when they go into the 
we have an intern year, when they go into the next level, the postgraduate level, but not so much different as you would think. And, and many people say after six weeks or so, you can hardly tell the difference. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's one thing. I mean, we had a few things like, oh, you can tell a Flinders student, oh, how? Well, because they ask questions. Is that a bad thing? But um, don't forget that PBL is one teaching method. You have many, many, many teaching methods in a curriculum. It's not the only teaching method. It's the teaching method you use if you want them to be active thinkers. Yeah. But the differences across the system, and it's the same in the United States and in Canada, the differences between the PBL schools and the other schools is not that great. Yeah. But it is very important to evaluate this. That's the key thing. So you must always make sure that you're evaluating how your students are achieving on your outcomes and, re and reporting it down, identifying gaps. You do find gaps. Every, every school should do this whether they're PBL or not. You find gaps. Okay, gaps that matter. We picked up a gap one year for a cohort of our students who did not seem to have developed um, I had exposure to, opportunity to develop some basic life support skills. So if you're evaluating and assessing at that level and identifying that and feeding the information down the system, you can correct that. Yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's an active management process. Yeah. Okay, more, uh, more questions. So we have uh, um, down the back here now, Mark, Mark. from Spain use and um, with the discuss of our room we have uh, I think that video is really a good uh, technique for the teacher can teach the student especially in school of med in medicine but we have some challenge yes and uh, we find one of challenges is how can the tutor uh, motivate the passive student the student in how uh, can don't want to spread that idea um, uh, get and uh, uh, attend to the discussion. So let's say you know, just You can learn it the next day. You can learn it the next day. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We will be talking. This is a this is um, a core topic in in being a PBL tutor about how to get the quiet students moving. Julie and I have done some reading and we also have some experience. We have a lot of international students come to our university. About one third of the class is from an Asian background, uh, international student. So we know that the students are used to different um, education systems. Um, education systems where um, uh, there's enormous um, emphasis placed on respect of the teacher and of listening and thinking and not necessarily questioning back, okay? Um, so the preparation of the students is really important for a start as a school. To create an environment in the school where we say this is permitted, that this is how we would like you to learn because we think it will be beneficial and we will support you to learn in this way. That preparation is really important. And um, so, as I said, we're going to do a little bit of preparation with your students, but it needs to be repeated and reinforced by all the staff, because that makes your role as a tutor much easier in terms of getting the students to be active. So part of that is, um, sometimes we have two tutorials to start with that are more about learning the PBL process than actually about the content. And it is, um, because we're saying you're going to learn how to be a PBL student and we're going to, you know, that's the purpose of this tutorial, um, we, we can really emphasise that driving of the discussion. And funnily enough, sometimes it's actually by the tutor not saying anything for a very long time until the group starts to talk. So, but we'll talk about this in the, work, in the workshop. So this way you need your most experienced PBL tutors. We have another question. 
I have one comment. Yeah, I have one comment about the the question of Professor Ding and of pediatric groups. Uh, as you know, uh, in PMU we apply the integrated curriculum for uh, at the beginning, and uh, you know that our post grade student they can pass the residency entrance examination already and most of them pass the master entrance examination of the other uh, university so i think that we don't worry about uh, that if we apply PPL for our student here they cannot pass the post the entrance examination of all other uh, university and we know that PPL is a way and method that our student can self-learning all the life long. Yes. So I think that they are very active and they are kind. Um, they um, they are appreciated by the uh, hospital. And with the budget of pediatric uh, group department, I will share the experiment of the experience of uh, OBGYN department. We know that PPL, that as, as the, my thinking, if I draw, please correct me. I think that PPL is also a uh, teaching method of literature, not all. I think that literature, but in a blog sheet, in a blog sheet, our students have to study also literature and practice. So we have to define balance between literature and practice. And with my opinion, practice is very important because you cannot have the patient to teach your student how they can feel the, the bell, how they can feel pain, for example. So practice is very important that we have to teach in our bloodship, also in, in beauty in the evening. So you have to choose the problem to teach. For example, we took year to teach which problem, fifth year which problem, sixth year which problem, not all the problem in the same time. So we always divide the time of the clerkship to teach literature by problem-based learning and very important in practice. And with the skill practice, it's not evaluate access by the PPL. You have to access by uh, OSCE or you can have to see how your student Examine yeah, the patient. Thank you. You're entirely correct. <laughs> yes, and I agree with everything you say. And I actually think what you raised an issue there that I think is very important about the students learning to use the literature. And I think it is something, particularly in the clinical years, that can be made a bit more explicit in the PBL. So when students are presenting information, oh, where did you read that? What is the quality of that resource, etc. You know, to, to, to start bringing those skills about, um, you know, they being critical of the literature and then knowing how to apply the literature. We know that to the case, we know that one of the uh, debates problems. In particularly in my country, is this question of why do doctors not translate evidence based into practice? And I think making that explicit in a tutorial, what's your evidence? Okay, so let's talk about what that means in terms of the case, is a way, particularly in the clinical, that you might be able to drive that. I think that this is a good point that you raise. Yeah, so it's very good, and I agree. All these things can be brought into a case if we design it to do so. And I think you're right, 
choose your topics for each cycle as, as we go through. And you may go from, you know, the common, more simpler through to complex. Yeah, as you go. Yeah. Uh, we have a question in the back there. Uh, uh, Teifu. Um, hello everybody, I come from the VNTO School of Medicine. Actually, I review a little bit shortly about the curriculum. Um, actually, the School of VNTO, um, the School of, Medicine, School of Medicine at VNTO, we integrate the medical curriculum with the PPL in the beginning. And for the first three years of the School of Medicine, so all of the students have study or not the smooth job, um, the organ system. So that when they go to the hospital, they have the knowledge. But how come to improve the knowledge for the student at the hospital? That's a big problem. So that we structure, the structure teaching the PPO um, is based on the real patient, right? So we have the real patient at the hospital, and we teach on that, we base on that. So that help the um, student for the structure um, learning the PPL experience with the clinical exposure in the hospital environment. That's it. I totally agree with you. And in uh, where I come from, um, there was a, a um, the surgeons that I worked with said, "Well, hang on." I when they're at the bedside in a clinical case, that's reality, a real case. That's beyond simulation. You know, simulation is a high fidelity simulation of what's real. Real is the real thing. PBL is the slower, more exposed, more elaborated, etc. Why would we replace the real thing with PBL? And that rationale has to be really clear. And one of the things is, when you are a student with the doctors and seeing a real patient. Um, if you are seeing them yourself, you are having to do that full clinical rehearsal yourself. But when you're with another doctor in an outpatient clinic or something, you can't see what's going on in the doctor's head. Yeah. So you cover many cases, you cover the curriculum, but how much, how deep is your understanding? So using PBL cleverly for the really core things that you really want to unpack and really get the students to think through this real, that balance of reality, the hot, what we call hot action, with the tutorial which allows us to unpack the cold action where the students can really get inside the thinking. Um, because as a beginner, when I drove, when I drove a car, my first drive, I was very slow. And then gradually, I began to put sequences of motion together into actions, and now I can drive fast. Well, thinking is similar. Think, we have to think slow first, and then as we start to chunk our knowledge together into schema, semantic networks, then we think fast, then we become pattern recognition. Yeah, yeah. so that's the, it's the balance, and, and each clinical department needs to work out that balance. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I won't tell you how to do it for us, each of our clinical departments have to do it. Yeah. More, quest more questions? So uh, I have uh, one comment about uh, this problem. The, the first one is uh, um, in the future, uh, in according to uh, Ministry of uh, Health and Education, uh, our graduate uh, students uh, must pass a national examination. So in the future, maybe from 2020, so all medical student, uh, all medical schools must change the curriculum to a problem-based curriculum because uh, all students must pass a national examination. Thanks. Wow. So knowing the nature of that examination will be very important. Um, knowing the nature of the evaluation uh, of the assessment and the domains it will cover because that allow you to design down. Um, because there are many ways to roam, we say, in expression in my country. 
many ways to get there, um, but you still get there. So the interesting part is uh, whether you get there alive and kicking and ready to go on, or whether you get there exhausted. <laughs> you know, so uh, you know what I mean. So you design your teaching method to make sure that your students get there alive and kicking and ready to go on. Yeah. So uh, in this the national examination, yeah. the students must do uh, many. Uh, uh, for example, more modified essay questions ah, ah, yeah. or uh, some uh, questions about uh, many uh, clinical situations. Yes. So, problem based uh, curriculum yeah. is very essential very for them yes. to prepare them for national examinations. Yes. So, that, that's a similar, um, I was talking about many cases, that's a similar type modified essay questions but in sequence. Yeah, and scenario based questions. Clinical, and so they're always having to read a scenario, problem solve it in order to answer the questions. Yeah. It sounds like there's some alignment there. Yeah. Whether or not you think national exams are a good thing, that sounds like there's some alignment. And the second one, we uh, I, I want to comment uh, that uh, maybe in the medical curriculum for uh, the first years, uh, the second years and uh, third years, the problem is very important and uh, we, uh, uh, we begin to with the problem first. But uh, uh, in uh, five years, six years medical uh, curriculum, we uh, must introduce a more uh, clinical case uh, yes. to change the clinical case. Yes. Yes, uh, that, that is important, um, which raises another um, aspect that I could perhaps discuss with you. Um, uh, there will be a curriculum, therefore, of types of clinical cases, right there. So mapping to those will be important across your six years. Um, and um, there is a potential with problem-based learning that you can add a further stage or modify it a little bit so that the students do one case but then have multiple cases that they then work through so and they can be mapped so so the students get good at more and more cases can apply their knowledge to more and more cases so that whatever cases they're getting in the national exam they're able to apply their knowledge and I know that um, the, the literature on clinical reasoning suggests the more cases you're exposed to the better your reasoning, yeah, because it, reasoning is case context, contextual, but there is translation to similar cases, and so the students may not have seen that case exactly that's in the national exam, but because they've rehearsed so many cases, they have a better chance of doing well. Yeah. Many cases supporting to be problem based learning. And uh, normally, the national examination in the whole medical uh, uh, school in Vietnam, there is some two parts. One part is more theory, and we apply the most in most of that is on test uh, MCQ. Uh, but that is only more theory. But for practice, you have, you have uh, one examination with case study. Yeah, because uh, practice is you're making an examination and you're going to take the skill with uh, case study all, all the way. Uh, we, uh, some, someone you said that we can make an only one test with MCQ, but that is the way done not agree that. Because the MCQ, you cannot control or examine the clinical the knowledge or the clinical skill. Uh, only case study, yes. yeah, and then we apply that. And here it is a VNU a school in MBC. We have a, on the, the top part. This is one one mini uh, 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 thesis, one mini thesis. Yes. Yeah, a mini thesis uh, yeah. to make it, uh, the student maybe know how to make one or one uh, yeah. Richard or some or mid. Very uh, small, but uh, we have a uh, three point uh, uh, MCQ, other the test one, one case study, and one, uh, one yeah. uh, mini yeah. thesis. Yeah, that's I think this is uh, how. Yeah, 
but uh, that, that's a problem that is on uh, how many the proportion proportion of PBL in the, in the, in the proportion uh, not too much, but uh, uh, how to because this cannot uh, uh, exchange, uh, uh, replace the mini case uh, yeah. in, in the public. Uh, Build the mini cases onto it. You, yeah. It, yeah um, okay. uh, is, is possible. And the story I was telling you about in Manchester, the paper by O'Neill that I, I, I think is in the packs, um, some of the power of their PBL tutorials was the students bringing each of their clinical cases as okay. presenting like a mini case and then the discussion extending to those mini cases, building their knowledge further. But yes, yeah, so your students, if they're doing this sort of assessment, when they get to the national exam, that format will not be a surprise. You know, um, it's good, you are preparing them for it. Yeah. Yeah. Any question? I'll see what you do. What is that? Question or comment? In your university, in the university and the, uh, the medicine pharmacy, you have experience or some question about that? Or the Eastern International? Can I do a little demonstration? Yeah. As you can see, after all this discussion, we have a board full of words. You know, I've tried to fill it as much as possible. But part of PBR and part of working collaboratively is co-construction of information. So what we've got up here is a lot of words and a lot of kind of I've put up comments everywhere. So after a PBL, you'll have something like this. But then you'll have other boards. You need lots of boards. Because then what we'll do is that we will look at this and say, we have got things that are similar themes here. Now we can pull those themes out and put them on another board and work in them more closely. So the clinical issues that have been raised can actually be then developed even further by, by the group discussing it. But it's visually in front of you. So you can see it and everybody in a group has a different way of looking at that problem and has a different suggestion for that problem. And I call that the rich learning soup. You know, you've got a big bowl of soup that, at the end that you can really make some sense in. But you're also putting it in its context. And by putting things in a context, it means that your brain, which if we look at some of the um, how we learn and how much information that we can put into our working memory, it's actually not very much. It's only about seven, seven items that we can put in. But what we want to do is we want to put it into our long-term memory. And the context actually enables us to chunk it. So I can actually have all the different bits of information and call that a chunk. And I can put that in. So that could actually be about the assessment, so we can be chunking our assessment information into our brain. When we come up with a problem, say, maybe you I'm sure you will encounter a problem with the um, national examination that's going to come up that might not align with what you've got. You've already got this chunked here, and then you can get other people who've got different forms of chunking to form together and then you'll be able to problem solve and you'll reach the sky. It's, um, as a tutor, it's spine tingling. It, it, do you know what I mean by that? It's very exciting to see the students all of a sudden get it. And it's, um, as a tutor, you will love it, honestly. It really is amazing. Thanks. Thanks, Jill. I mean, I think it's really important to point out that, you know, this is like a PBL board. We have done a sense, and we, this is what we've shared, so everyone knows what we've talked about. I mean, it helps people to take those um, uh, knowledge leaps when they can see how everything works together. So that's what's happening in the PBL. It's nice to draw that analogy. Um, is anything else anyone would like to say at this stage? Yeah? I think this is time is um, out. Because this is the twelve in Vietnam, we said them don't pass the twelve. Yeah. Everything is uh, no more effective when they pass it. Yeah. <laughs>
à, nghĩa là mưa cũng không mưa gió đừng quá ngọ mà và bây giờ là tới ngọ rồi kéo kéo thêm chỉ là vô duyên thôi chứ không được gì hết à, nói chung là buổi sáng như này chúng tôi chỉ xin nói một câu cuối cùng thế này thực sự cái curriculum gọi là system based internet curriculum à, đang giờ đang làm ở đây à, chúng tôi đang trao đổi gì với các chị đó thực sự nó cũng là một cái gọi là modified chứ không phải là một cái cái cái, cái module hoàn toàn đâu có nghĩa rằng có thay đổi một số vì các anh chị biết rằng luật không cho phép đụng chạm tới năm thứ nhất có nghĩa là chính trị mắt lên lên tư tưởng hồ chí minh từ giáo dục thể chất là miễn bàn chứ còn nếu đưa các chuyên gia mà sẽ thiết kế đó thì những cái đó nó không có trong năm thứ nhất và họ đưa vô trong đó những mô đi trong năm thứ nhất rồi nhưng mà năm thứ nhất không được đụng đến à, coi như phạm quỷ cho nên trong năm thứ nhất vẫn y như là tất cả các trường khác chỉ thay đổi trong năm thứ hai năm thứ ba và năm thứ tư thôi còn tới cuối năm thứ tư năm thứ năm năm thứ sáu chúng tôi lại trở lại clap ship clap ship tức là giống như là nội ngoại sản nhi như vậy cũng là là rotation giống như những trường khác chứ không không làm hết đâu bởi vậy cho nên là thực sự đánh giá cái này nó như thế nào không phải chế nhưng mà rất mong thì các anh chị ở các cái bệnh viện khác đó như nơi khác đó có sinh viên của đại học uh, khoa y đại học Jaja ja, các anh chị đánh giá dùng hộ những người đó đứng về mặt lý thuyết thì các em nó chịu khó rồi tại vì nghe nói rằng đây là những uh, phi công lái máy bay thí nghiệm cho nên là phải cố gắng nhiều vì vậy cho nên ra trường rất là chịu khó học và tất cả các em đó khi thi các cái đông giống như chị lời nói khi thi vô các cái thần tuyển sinh sau đại học của đại học y dược đại học phạm ngọc thành là đều đỗ với cái tỷ lệ rất cao chứng tỏ rằng không có vấn đề gì khiếm khuyết đứng về mặt lý thuyết còn cái thực hành thì chúng tôi chưa dám nói còn thực hành thì theo chúng tôi chắc phải đứng đoán sau năm 10 năm nữa như em đó trở lại làm ở các bệnh viện có phát huy được không có tiến được không do những cái chuyện xem đi hay là xem lập đi với vợ các thứ thì lúc đó mới đánh giá sau chúng tôi hoàn toàn không nói nên chỉ nói rằng không đến nỗi có những cái học để cho không thể theo kịp tất cả các trường khác còn lại chúng ta sẽ cùng đánh giá với nhau không phải trường này trường kia vân vân các thứ để có được một cái cách đào tạo tốt nhất cho y khoa và đấy là mong muốn của những cái buổi như hôm nay theo tôi thì buổi sáng ngày hôm nay cũng đã đến đây là vừa rồi xin mời các anh chúng ta tạm nghỉ ở đây và có cái bữa ăn mời tất cả các chị nha mời tất cả các chị giữ uh, à, chúng tôi mời tất cả và xuống dưới các nhà ăn và là chiều nay thì những người nào tham gia cái uh, cái khóa này ta dừng sẽ có những cái thí dụ hẳn hoi tức là làm trên những cái ca cụ thể và chúng ta sẽ trở lại đây vào sáng ngày thứ sáu và cho những cái thảo luận có tính chất hơi chung nó đẹp sáng ngày thứ sáu và có cái gì để bàn tổ chức Cảm ơn Thưa các thầy cô là buổi sáng, 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 buổi sá